Hello, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to Satsang. Satsang is an ancient spiritual practice from India. It means being in reality together. I give Satsang live every Wednesday and Sunday night in Portland, Maine. This Dharma talk was recorded during one of our Wednesday night gatherings. Please visit jayakula.org to learn more about the teachings. You can find video satsangs on Jayakula's YouTube channel, and my books are all available on Amazon.com. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. The word for naturalness in Sanskrit is sahaja. And you may have heard me talk about that we do something called sahaja meditation. But I think that sahaja is the best word for, in this, in our tradition, the best word for self-realization, for enlightenment. If we want to get down to the absolute core of what we mean when we say something like self-realization or enlightenment, what we're really talking about is naturalness. Now, of course, many of you have encountered people, or maybe you are one of these people on occasion, and when you do something really cruddy, you say, I'm just being myself. <laughs> Usually is, you know, an excuse for something. That's not what we mean when we say sahaja. <laughs> so that sahaja is, and that self, when you say I'm just being myself, that self is your limited self. That self is your self that's still carrying around all of its karmas, all of its limitations, all of its tensions. So that's not the self that we're trying to realize. We already have realized that self. <laughs> of course. We're very good at that. <laughs> when we talk about natural, naturalness, we're talking about something primordial, something that comes before or sits behind or uh, gives rise to these experiences that we're having right now. So something more original, something less uh, encumbered, and that, that self is the world self. That self is totally without any contrivance. Contrived is what our karmas make us. We are contrived by our emotional tensions. By, we are very highly constrained and contrived by our ideas about ourselves and other people in life and how things are supposed to be. We really suffer from those things, our ideas about right and wrong and our ideas about good and bad and our ideas about proper and improper, sinful and holy, all of these ideas about things we suffer from tremendously and we make other people suffer from them too if we're in a certain mood. But that primordial state which is naturalness itself, which is completely uncontrived and unconditioned, we say, unconditioned by any particular state, by any particular event, by any particular history, by any particular form, completely unconditioned. And for that reason, spontaneous. That is the base of everything else. It's the basis of our entire existence. We rise out of it like waves rising out of an ocean. And we need to discover that ocean and stop being convinced that we're just little waves with all sorts of ideas about how waves should behave and other little waves should behave. So the natural state, you could say, naturalness itself, is complete. It's complete and it's replete. These words mean that there is nothing missing and there is a experience of contentment. 
This is an aspect of that primordial natural state. In order to embody that, in order to realize that essence, your own essence nature, which is naturalness, this kind of primordial cosmic naturalness, in order to embody that, you have to recognize it first. You have to remember it. You have to go, oh, wait, yeah, hey, yeah, I know you. Oh, yeah, how did I forget you? And then all of the practices that we do, all of the meditation and mantras and all of that, their sole purpose is to have you recognize that more fully and embody it more fully until you are embodying it in an unbroken way. And at that time when you do begin to embody it, you move from the effort of practice, the effort of doing all these different practices that we do, into a condition of more effortlessness. Naturalness is completely without any effort. Ananda Mahima says that we move from effort to effortless being. This is the progress of our practice. So naturalness isn't just being as we are right in this moment. It's recognizing that everything is that primordial naturalness and then experiencing everything that's happening now from that place so that we can be totally relaxed. If we understand and and have a feeling for that naturalness, the ease, the perfection of that state, then everything that happens just is an expression of that state. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing ever wrong with anything. And there's nothing wrong with us. There's nothing wrong with other people. In order to realize that, of course, we have to let go of a lot of those tensions about uh, feeling like we're incomplete, that we aren't full, that we're missing things. But the whole practice really can be summed up in this one word of Sahaja. Namkai Norba Rinpoche, one of my teachers, wrote a little book, which unfortunately is out of print, and I've been trying to get a copy of it. Um, But the book is called A Little Song of Do As You Please. (laughs) <laughs> and um, I've just managed to get this little snippet and I think that Shang Shang, the, the organization that publishes his books is going to come out with this again, I hope so but he writes, in the natural condition the supreme space which does not fall into the limits of measurement or even the concept of direction whatever presents itself there I enjoy as an ornament I don't make any effort to create or reject anything. So there's this sense when you're resting in that natural condition that there's nothing to do. In other words, not that you do nothing, not that you're passive, but there's no sense of urgency about anything. There's no sense of having a mission in life. There's no sense of this compulsion to change things. Everything that you do, you recognize as just an ornament of that state. And so everything has a lightness to it. Even when you're having, you know, to be heavy, like I have to be heavy with you guys sometimes. But even that has a sense of playfulness or lightness to it, unless you're on the receiving end. (laughs) But, you know, the students who are a little more advanced in their practice even recognize the lightness and playfulness when the sword comes for their neck. (laughs) Because you begin to have a direct experience that everything that's happening is arising from this incredibly uh, beautiful, pristine consciousness and energy. And that everything is that. And so all the sense of, you know, worry and having to do this or that uh, is, has gone away, even though you could still have tremendous freedom to act in the world, much more freedom than you have now. You're much less constrained. Everything has this attitude of playfulness, of doing as you please. So there's this total lack of contrivance, even the contrivance of planning what you're going to say or what you're, how you're going to respond to something. Much, many of you spend a lot of time planning what to say, rehearsing situations in your minds, deciding how to be, how should I be, 
Right. This is all aspects of that contrivance that is grounded in fear and self-protectiveness. When you are recognizing this natural primordial condition and just living more from that base, then all of that just melts away. There's, you know, you, you, you enter into a state of natural spontaneity. I very, very rarely think before I speak. <laughs> and that's very relaxing. You guys are leading, you know, double, triple, quadruple <laughs> lives because you're living everything, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve times. First, you have to rehearse it ten times. Then you do something. Then you have to re- remember it and, like, go over how you did, you know, and grade yourself a dozen times after that. That's exhausting. <laughs> It's such a waste of time, yeah. So this Sahaja is also called in, in the biz um, Sahaja Samadhi. So you've heard of all these different Samadhis probably if you've read anything at all related to the Indian tradition. Uh, you know, they're crazy for coming up with all these different levels of Samadhi and uh, which one's better. And, you know, well, I'm at level 7.2. <laughs> But Sahaja Samadhi just means that state of effortless being in which you are totally identified with and immersed in that natural state. Right? That's what it means. That's what, and then you actually know who you are. You actually are recognizing yourself. When you recognize that uncontrived state, that state of naturalness, you have seen yourself. You are experiencing your own primordial essence nature. That's what it is. This is someone describing an Andamaima. She was stabilized in Sahaja Samadhi, natural Samadhi, the natural state of effortless abidance in the self, regardless of one's external circumstances. When questioned whether she had descended to a lower level in order to appear before everyone, she replied, whatever anyone might say is all right, but there is no such thing as higher and lower levels. So this is what you realize when you are really profoundly, primordially relaxed. You realize that there is nothing wrong, that there are no higher and lower levels, that you are not missing anything, that you are not incomplete, that there's nothing to worry about. Like Ma said, why worry? Ma is here. She meant Ma is everywhere. This primordial condition is everywhere. Why worry? In our practice, we are not trying to fix ourselves. The attitude that we're fixing ourselves is absolutely diametrically opposed to the view of this tradition. You are simply letting go of some natural experiences of limitation. Absolutely natural experiences. There is nothing happening here that was not created by God and everything it is utterly natural there is nothing sinful there is nothing unnatural there is nothing wrong there is nothing evil these these ideas that torture us are simply aspects of the this incredibly multifaceted creation and all the different experiences that are available and what we what we discover when we relax those ideas is that everything is this shining consciousness and energy and we are that and there's nothing wrong so we're not trying to fix ourselves because we don't need fixing we need to relax the idea that we need fixing that doesn't mean and this is again it gets kind of paradoxical hard to wrap your mind around it doesn't mean that we just throw in the towel and go what the fuck I don't care (laughs) you know I'll be a pig I'll be a murderer (laughs) The only way that we can divest ourselves of these experiences of limitation is by realizing the Supreme Self. That's the only way to do it. Lazing around and just giving into your fixations won't get you there. That's just another concept. Just another concept. 
the realization of your true nature of utter uncontrived naturalness is not conceptual. It's not a state. It's not an idea. It's not something you kind of get. It's actually your own essence nature and when you recognize it, you have wisdom. Recognizing it and embodying it is the same as having wisdom. You will then naturally and unavoidably begin to express the wisdom virtues of which that primordial state is, com is composed. So we have absolutely nothing to worry about. We don't have to worry about being compassionate. We don't have to worry about being kind. We don't have to worry about any of that because it's all built into our essence nature as are the limitations that we're experiencing right now. They're all coming from the same pot. So all we need to do is relax very, very deeply and we have to make a big effort to do that. A big effort because we have this little thing called attachment. So little. So little. We're attached to pleasure. We're attached to pain. We're attached to our suffering. We're attached to everything. We're food, sex, work, friends, family, ideas, bodies, nations, genders, colors, sexuality. <laughs> We're just like bundles of attachment. And all of these attachments carve out the uniqueness of everything that's happening, right? All of these attachments make all of these different worlds appear. They're part of the creativity of this reality. So again, there's nothing wrong with those attachments, but if we want to be living from that primordial state with awareness, we have to get out of those limitations and start to re-identify and re-remember and re-embody this bigger self. And then we become more and more uncontrived, more and more spontaneous, uh, less premeditated in our actions, and we begin to understand and we begin to participate in what I like to call the call and response nature of the world. So this, everything that's being created here through this natural process, there's nothing outside of this, everything is part of nature no matter how horrible we think it is. We're having this experience of talking to each other and being responded to, but also we're responding to a lot of things and there's many more subtle energies and subtle wisdoms that we could be responding to if our senses were more relaxed. So once we become more identified with this naturalness, part of what comes along with that is an, an, ex, an enhanced ability to communicate and to be in a state of responsivity. So what we do is we replace our aggressiveness and our defensiveness because when we think we are just these little bodies, we're very aggressive and defensive in lots of different ways. Why do you rehearse everything 12 times? Why? Because you're defending yourself. You're defending a self-image. You're also being aggressive. You think you're being insecure. You know, the pop psychologists have told you that you do that because you have a, a weak self-image or you're insecure. You're actually, you know, like a war machine. You're manipulating other people aggressively when you do that. Trying to make other people, force, forcibly make other people think of you a certain way, relate to you a certain way. You want other people to have a certain specific experience. That's why, why you're doing this. So it's both self-defensive and tremendously aggressive. This whole project of forming a self-image and defending it in the moment, which totally robs us of any spontaneity. And it also is tremendously manipulative and aggressive towards other people. So this is what falls away and this immediacy takes, it pla takes its place. This immediacy that is not in the mind, it's in the senses, it's in all of the senses. And the senses become tremendously more subtle. We, be, we are able to sense and feel things that we can't sense and feel now. And so we're, we, you know, life becomes much more like living in this infinite orchestra of sounds and gestures 
rather than just, you know, maybe a quartet or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Our range of responsiveness becomes much deeper and wider. And it's, it's a lot of fun. As we do practice, we are making effort toward dropping all need for effort. That's what we're doing. It's very, very simple. We're not trying to create anything. Everything's already being created. Reality doesn't need us to create anything. We're not changing consciousness. We're not fixing ourselves. We don't need fixing. We're simply participating in nature. Sadhana is part of nature. We're participating in nature by doing sadhana, a natural process, and discovering that ultimate naturalness, sahaja. It's a beautiful word that's used in lots of just different traditions in India, uh, and also in the Tibetan traditions sometimes. And it really takes the glare off of ideas of enlightenment and self-realization. Those can be words that people fixate on and get used competitively, can be scary, all kinds of things, you know, those words, self-realization and enlightenment. But really what we're talking about is this primordial naturalness. Jayakula is a nonprofit community offering opportunities to learn and practice in the direct realization traditions of Trika Shaivism and Dzogchen. We are based in Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon. Visit jayakula.org to explore more of our offerings.